everybody, and welcome to the Texas Real Estate and Finance Podcast Market Update for the week of April the 9th. I'm your host, Mike Mills, a local North Texas mortgage banker with Geneva Financial. I do this podcast every single week, but when I'm not spouting nonsense into the internet, I help people buy and refinance their home. So if you need help with any of your clients or solving any lending problems, please feel free to give me a shout. I'm way better at loans than I am at this stuff. So yesterday, if you were in the path of the eclipse, you truly witnessed a historic event. Because no solar eclipse will be visible in the contiguous United States again until 2044. I was out there with my son watching it. It really was pretty cool. Um, once, if you were in the area where you got total coverage, you actually saw a complete blackout. Like it went dark for about five minutes. Animals were acting a little crazy. It was a little weird. And then it just brightened right back up again. So it was a pretty awesome experience. I was kind of low-key, not overly excited about it just because, you know just an eclipse what's it going to do but when you actually see it witness it it was pretty awesome so if you got to check it out um i hope you were as wowed by it as i was so sorry i've been off on the market update the past couple weeks i had a few changes in my studio one week had a little bit of internet connection and so we're just kind of getting my feet back underneath me again uh getting back on the market update also got pretty busy with some loans which is a good thing but uh you know you got to figure out how to balance work with the fun stuff which is this so that's why we're back at it today so today we're going to go over a few basic topics like we always do interest rates a few market trends but we're going to be really heavy on the nar and department of justice and kind of the future of our industry topic so we'll dive into interest rates um, some overall housing market stuff. So you guys are up to speed with what's happening in our market right now. But then we're going to dive into what's going on with the NAR settlement and the ruling last week by U.S. Uh, Court of Appeals in uh, D.C. that the Department of Justice can reopen the antitrust case against NAR for anti-competitive practices. That settlement that we got in the Sitzer Burnett case is not the end of this. And the Department of Justice is now involved again. So Big moves happening right now. But let's go ahead and get into some housing market numbers before we dig into the meat of today's episode. Um, we're going to start with everybody's favorite, interest rates. So right now, rates are around 7% to 7.375, depending on what your current situation is. There's been a lot of fluctuation in the market over the past couple of weeks. You know, we've gone from the high sixes to the low sevens and back and forth probably the last couple of months multiple times. And right now, my expectation is that we're probably going to stay in this range all the way through the summer, unless there's something dramatic that happens in the economy. Because the problem that we have right now is the recent job data that's showing that we're adding all these jobs into the economy and that the economy is going really strong. Now, never mind that the jobs that were added were mostly part-time jobs and that we haven't actually added any full-time jobs to the economy since August of 2023. Meanwhile, we've added almost 1.4 million part-time jobs during that same exact period. So I guess the economy is booming for all the part-time gig workers out there, but for those trying to hold down a full-time job to support your family and, and trying to pay for all the stuff that's got incredibly expensive, it's really not looking that great because we really just haven't added full-time jobs and the numbers really bear it out. But unfortunately, all we see are headlines. We don't often get the meat of the, the meat of the actual numbers. And there's been a ton of revisions that have actually revised down the job numbers over the past several months. If you go back and look over the last 12 months, I think we've had anywhere between nine to 12 revisions to the negative side. But unfortunately, the market follows headlines, not always reality. And this week, we're also getting inflation numbers. And honestly, expectations are right now that there's not going to be a ton of improvement, which also isn't good for the interest rates for mortgages. In fact, with oil prices spiking up over the last several months, you're probably see a slight increase in inflation, at least on the headline number. When you get down to the core inflation, which does strip out oil and gas prices, it kind of stays even. But either way, those oil and gas prices seep into everything because it costs to deliver goods to the market. It costs to ship things back and forth. So all of this is playing a role. And with higher oil prices, because of all the conflict that's occurring overseas, you're starting to see that inflation not come down at the same pace that it was because right now it's still above three percent and with the feds target being two percent that's what they're aiming for and that's ultimately where they're trying to get so in order for the fed to decide to pivot and start cutting rates we either need inflation to continue to tick down at a good steady pace towards two percent doesn't have to get to two percent as jerome powell said but it does need to start heading in that direction or we're going to have to see unemployment tick above four percent Right now, we're sitting at a right around 3.8, 3.9 after this last jobs report, which again, you know, when you look at the overall employment numbers, when you factor in the amount of people that have actually left the job market altogether, you know, these numbers probably aren't that incredibly accurate, but it is what it is. And this is what they're showing us on the headline. So until we get above that 4% mark, you're not going to see the Fed pivot and start to cut their Fed rate. So when the Fed goes to meet next month in May, the expectation right now is that rates are going to stay the same. And actually, as we move into June, which is the next Fed meeting after that, the odds of the rate cut have been steadily declining. You know, I think at the beginning of this year, we were somewhere around 90% expectation of a Fed rate cut in June. Now we're closer to like 40%. So the market overall is not 
living with expectations that we think the Fed's going to pivot and start cutting rates when we get to June. So even if they do, they still are sticking with the fact that they say they're going to cut rates three times this year, but it may not happen until the end of the year. And many in the market are starting to anticipate we may not get those three rate cuts. We might only get one or two at the most. So when you're talking to your clients out there and asking where rates are headed, as it stands right now, we're probably going to be somewhere between this high sixes, low sevens, maybe even up to mid sevens if we don't get true improvement over the next foreseeable future, or at least over the next couple of months. Because I don't see a place unless, again, inflation starts to you know inc decline incredibly, which the numbers are bearing out that that's not really going to happen. Or we start to see a higher unemployment rate, which, you know, the the division that or I should say the uh, entity or government body that puts out these numbers, the BLS, that kind of compiles these and the and the the equations that they use to come up with these figures aren't really helping our case. And regardless of if they're incredibly accurate or a true measure of how unemployment's working in the economy right now, the numbers are the numbers, and that's what they're going to base everything off of. So until there's a until there's a change in that, you're not going to see rates come down. But there's still plenty of people out there predicting that we may get into the low sixes by the end of this year. Look, as a mortgage person hoping to do some refis, hoping to help people get back into the market, I'm all for it. I just, at this point in time, I don't see that that's going to happen, but I hope I'm wrong. All right, let's move on to just the housing market in general. So in February, the median home market price was $412,000 in the United States in February of 2024. Now that's up 0.6% compared to two months ago. So inflation is still affecting housing because prices are still increasing. And in the last Fed meeting, Jay Powell was actually asked specifically about home prices not coming down. But when asked this question, he told a reporter that he's focused on overall inflation and not focused on housing meaning that prices can continue to still go up. And I'm a broken record on this, but the reason that we still continue to see house prices go up, even with overall mortgage applications declining, and even with um, these high interest rates is simply because there's just not enough homes. So if there's not enough homes for sale and there's still enough demand for that, you're gonna see, you're gonna continue to see prices go up. And just to reiterate that point on the supply, currently right now, there are 1.4 million homes available for sale in the United States. And just to give you a context, Pre-pandemic, we had more than 2 million homes for sale. That's 25% less houses available now than they were prior to the pandemic. And oh, by the way, we're up compared to where we were in 2022. So inventory is actually improving. So when you, when you hear people talking about how we're gaining more inventory, that's true. But we're still not even close to where we were prior to the pandemic in 2019. And inventory overall fell again last week because now we're getting to the spring and summer buying season. As a matter of fact, from March 29th to April 5th, inventory fell from 517,000 houses to 512,000 houses. And in this same week last year, from March 30th to April 7th, inventory actually went up 1,000 homes. And this is a weekly change, by the way. This isn't the overall homes for sale. And again, to give you context, the overall all-time inventory bottom that we've experienced in the market was back in 2022 when there were only 240,000 homes homes available for sale. And the inventory peak that we experienced just for 2023, not the entire market history, but for 2023 was 569,000. So we're already down from our peak that we experienced in 2023. So as it stands right now, I don't see a crash in home prices coming. The only thing that's going to make that happen is if interest rates continue to stay high and there's some sort of super economic event where what they call like a black swan event where banks go out or, you know, multiple companies start laying off people in mass, whatever the case may be. That's the only thing that's going to cause home prices to go down because it's basic supply and demand. Either you have a demand for homes that you have enough supply for or you don't. And right now, the demand, even with high rates and even with high prices, is still overall superseding the supply. So the only way that you're going to see home prices come down is if we have a glut of supply hit the market and demand stays low. And given the current conditions, I don't see where that's happening. It's not like we're building a ton of homes or have a ton of homes available that are being permitted out that are that are going to hit the market soon. As a matter of fact, we still have 26% of homes selling above list price. But that's kind of normal. That's like a normal market average. On, on average, you're seeing about 25 to 30% of the homes listed for sale selling above above list price because of certain areas, you know, get higher demand. But just to give you a better understanding of why I don't expect the supply to grow right now, housing starts, which is just basically builders applying for permits to start building new homes in, in parts of the country are about 1.4 million per year. And in order to meet just our household demand or the growth of, you know, millennials and uh, Gen Z on for household formations, we need to be at like 1.86 million over the next 10 years just to meet the current demand. So if the demand increases, we are so far undersupplied that you're going to continue to see home prices go up. And when you see any headlines of when they talk about home prices for new builds starting to come down, this is also true. You are seeing the median price for new builds come down, but this isn't necessarily because people aren't buying them. 
what's occurring is builders are building cheaper homes, but they're not building them for cheaper. You're sacrificing square footage and often construction quality. So even the new homes that are coming on the market that are lower priced, it's because you're getting instead of instead of a 2,500 or 3,000 square foot home, now it's 2,000 square feet or now it's 1,800 square feet. And some of the construction quality isn't quite at the level that it's always been. And because of all this, our share of first time home buyers has dropped dramatically over the last couple of years. Right now, the market share of first time home buyers is only 26% of the total market. And historically, it's been closer to around 40%. So we're almost half of what we normally are for first time home buyers penetration into the market. And that again comes to higher home prices, higher interest rates, and just lack of options. And a trend that's not helpful right now is that investors, people that are purchasing homes to rent out of single family homes, not of apartment complexes or multi-unit, but single family homes that own more than a hundred. So this isn't your mom and pop investor. These are people that own a hundred homes or more is up to almost 6% of the total market and it continues to grow. And this is way up from where it was just three years ago. It's almost double. So although 6% isn't a massive chunk of the market, it's still a big piece and it's growing rapidly every single day. As a matter of fact, one in 10 houses in 2023 were purchased for cash. And that's one of the highest figures recorded since 1989. Now, the fact that they were purchased for cash doesn't always mean investors. It could be people that are downsizing or moving from other states to be able to pay cash because they don't want to have those interest rates. So that number can be a little deceiving. I'm not saying that that's entirely indicative of the fact that we have these large investors coming in and buying up homes. But what it does tell us is that there's a lot more cash available out there that's able to purchase on the market that otherwise wouldn't have been doing when interest rates were low. And more often than not, these are not your first time home buyers. These are people with money, investors, people that have cash to play in the market and still see real estate as a good investment. And to me, overall, this is just a further indication that currently the housing market is savagely unhealthy because we have high home prices, we have high interest rates, we have low demand overall. And when you pair that with all of the current lawsuits that are happening in our industry right now, it, it, it creates a lot of concern on what the future of our business is going to look like for the next five to 10 years. Real estate's always going to be here. People are always going to buy and sell homes, but the share of average Americans that can go in and purchase these homes at these prices with these rates, with this lack of supply keeps getting more and more diminished. And with the people that are representing them being basically attacked right now, you're going to see a big shift in the market over the next couple of years. And unfortunately, it's not looking like it's going to be a positive shift. We might have a few instances where you know we get a bump down in rates and the, and the market picks back up again and people come into trying to purchase house because they see rates come down and that'll be great. And for those that are able to survive this slow time and make it through, they will directly benefit from that. So that'll be a good thing. But I feel like that'll probably be short lived, at least for the time being, because we're not going to have enough homes unless there is something that occurs via regulation or via a new, you know, somebody coming in like, you know, right now, hell, Amazon's offering homes that you can purchase online for like $30,000 and Home Depot is doing the same thing. You're buying these tiny homes that you can finance and drop on land, but that's a whole other discussion for another day. But unless there's some sort of adjustment in how these homes are built and constructed to keep the cost to where the average American can afford it with all of the costs going up dramatically for everything else in life, gas, food, electricity, you know, all the energy costs that continue to increase, all of this stuff is going to cause more and more strain on the housing market as a whole and put individuals in a place where they're going to choose to rent, especially because right now renting is substantially cheaper than owning a home. It's just the truth. Now, it's not a good long-term play and, you know, renting is not good for neighborhoods and not good for housing in the United States in general. We want to give people the right to home ownership. But if you're struggling to pay your bills right now or struggling to feed your family, then, and you could pay a thousand dollars less in housing expense because you can just rent for a little while, you're going to take that option because it's survival at this point. So all of these things are kind of coordinating together to put in, put us into a place where it doesn't feel like we have a really strong future for where housing is headed. There will be opportunity for a lot of individuals, but we are I don't see a road where we're going back to where we were prior to 2020. I think our market is going to be dramatically changed once we do come out of this, which we will. So speaking of all that, let's now that we know that rates are probably going to be higher for longer and we know that home prices are not coming down because we're in short supply, even with the high rates and the high prices and lower demand, let's talk about the real villain of this story overall to why home prices are so much more and why first time home buyers can't even afford to buy. Who's the real villain in this story? If you're paying attention to what's happening in the media, it isn't the Fed for making money too cheap and exploding the demand. 
it isn't institutional investors buying up all the single family residences and paying cash and renting them out. And it isn't builders or municipalities not building enough homes to meet demand. Nobody's talking about any of these things. The true villain that you're seeing in the media right now is you, the local realtor making an average of about $60,000 a year, closing about one deal a month. You are the true scapegoat in this entire situation. Because the way it's portrayed right now, you're the problem, at least according to all the lawsuits, the media, and the Department of Justice. You evil realtors have been colluding all along to rob your friends and neighbors in your community that you serve of all their money, according to all the stories out there. Never mind that this method of buying and selling homes has been in place for over 100 years and helped turn housing into 30% of our national GDP. Never mind that this system has helped first-time home buyers that have limited resources to be able to buy a home with the help of sellers paying commissions that were paid for them when they bought their home. Never mind that big corporate interests have been trying to get into the real estate market over the last 20 years with little to no success and now have a clear path to taking over the housing market since your local neighborhood realtor is now the worst person on the planet. But this is where we are. And unfortunately, the reality is, is that many of you out there don't even fully realize the massive shift that's about to take place in your business. It doesn't feel like it right now because rates are high and nothing has actually been put in place yet or enacted. Right now, there's just pieces on the board being moved into position to strike when the time is right. What are some of these moves, you ask? Well, you should all know by now that NAR settled the Sitzer Burnett case and they agreed to pay out a fine. But more importantly, they agreed to remove the offer of compensation completely from the listing agreements and the MLS. Going as far to say in the settlement that you probably can't even make an offer of compensation in your listing description that you put on the MLS. Even if you have a motivated seller that's willing to pay the buyer agent so they could get more buyers and drive up competition. And if that settlement's approved, this is supposed to go into effect July of this year. That's three months away. Now, based on many conversations that I've had with agents over the last several months, and even some new technologies that I've seen pop up tools that people can use for their local websites many agents were planning on listing the buyer agent comp offer on their own personal websites because that's like a freedom of speech you can put if it's your personal website and you want to put something on there that you can do that and you know honestly that's not a bad little workaround right it's going to require a little bit more research from the side of the agents and maybe the side of the buyers but if you have a seller that's willing to pay a buyer agent you need to be able to put it somewhere right well hang on just a minute now last week a federal appeals court in dc cleared a path for the department of justice to reopen the antitrust case against nar that they closed over over two years ago. And in this court ruling, the assistant attorney general to the United States said that real estate commissions in the United States greatly exceed those in any other developed country. And this decision restores the antitrust division's ability to investigate potentially unlawful conduct by NAR that may be contributing to this problem. Apparently, in this particular case, when it comes to real estate commissions, we want to be like every other developed country. But when it comes to healthcare and uh, other things like that, we're happy to be ourselves. Now, in this brief, the Department of Justice went on to say that in their view, as long as listing agents can continue to make and advertise compensation offers to buyer agents, steering incentives will exist. So let that sink in. Sitzer Burnett was settled out and, and everybody agreed to terms just saying that the offer of compensation to the buyer's agent just needed to be removed from the listing agent in the MLS. Once that occurred, the Department of Justice immediately went in to open the antitrust case, stating as long as listing agents can continue to make and advertise compensation offers to buyer agents, steering incentives will still exist. Now, I read that as saying that ultimately what the Department of Justice is trying to do is completely ban the ability for a seller to pay a buyer agent commission. And by the way, they've said this before. They feel like, Sellers should pay seller agents and buyers should pay buyer agents. And I understand the sentiment, but making such a dramatic shift like that over a short period of time is going to really dramatically affect the housing market. But ultimately, it looks like that's where this is headed. And again, I'm not a fan of this. I'm not rooting for this. I think it's terrible. But I think there may even be more things that we haven't considered yet that the Department of Justice might throw out there as well. So in the industry, we kind of know this. But when you look at these decisions, who is this ultimately going to help? And who is this ultimately going to hurt? As a realtor out there and dealing in this market as long as you have, does anybody in our role actually expect home prices are going to be reduced now because agent commissions are probably going to decline due to these changes? We really believe that sellers are going to be willing to sell their homes for less? Or are they going to do like they've always done and just take the comps that have been established in the old system and use it to make more money this time around since they don't have to pay the buyer agent who they also didn't have to pay when they bought their home? And look, I'm all for people making extra money. Absolutely. but 
there's a lot of sellers out there that had buyer agent commissions paid on their behalf that they're not going to have to pay. So the seller is going to win in the short term, but it's not going to help the housing market overall. And it's certainly not going to help buyers. And right now, the only people that are obviously going to benefit from this is the lawyers who stand to make millions of dollars from these settlements. Even the plaintiffs of these class action lawsuits don't, don't stand to make more than $100. And it's probably even less than that. I hear people saying estimates of like $25 that'll get paid out to each one of these people on these settlements. 30% of that total settlement is going to go to all the lawyers that fought the case. So we're going to get to the real beneficiaries of these cases here shortly. But who does this ultimately hurt? Well, it hurts realtors and their families and how they make a living. It hurts first-time home buyers who barely have enough money for a down payment and closing costs. And now we're also going to have to figure out how to pay for their representation in one of the biggest, most complicated transactions in their entire life. It's going to hurt underserved communities and low-income families looking to get out from under the world of perpetual rent and always living paycheck to paycheck with very few ways to save for retirement. It's going to hurt the rate of home ownership in this country overall that's always been correlated with safer communities, stronger families, higher education levels, and higher income. But if you turn on the cable news or read a national newspaper, you would think that we've slayed the realtor dragon, helping millions of Americans save money by not paying those commissions. That's what you're being told. And now, because of all this, real estate is a place where lawsuits just come and thrive. And it's starting to bleed into the mortgage world. Last Last week, one of the largest wholesale brokers on the planet, United Wholesale Mortgage, is being sued for steering. They have an antitrust case coming against them. This isn't ending, folks. This is all just beginning. So from my point of view, this is not doing anything but taking an already incredibly unhealthy housing market and making it so much worse. So why? Why did all this happen? And who really benefits from this chaos and change? Well, let me introduce you to a company, if you haven't already heard of them, called BlackRock. And for that matter, Vanguard. BlackRock is a massive hedge fund that owns anything and everything you can imagine, and the majority of anything and everything. And Vanguard is also an investment platform that shares in this same level of ownership. And oh, by the way, Vanguard and BlackRock are the heaviest investors in each other. So it's basically just one company operating in two different names. They own pieces of Trulia, Zillow, Realtor.com, and Open Door. In fact, they're the two biggest shareholders in all those companies. And between the two of them, they own massive shares, if not the most shares, and almost all of the S&P 500, from media, to food, to telecom, to energy company. They literally own everything. But do you know what they don't own and haven't been able to own? Housing. The housing market and the housing industry has been owned by local realtors and local lenders for 100 years. But the housing market is a multi-trillion dollar business. It's 30% of the country's GDP. It's the most profitable money-moving business in the world. And that big money, they want to control that business. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but at one point, Zillow was paying NAR to access listings through several different companies. When that didn't quite work out the way they wanted, Zillow became a brokerage so they themselves could access the local MLSs in all major markets. And again, BlackRock owns Zillow, Open Door, Realtor.com. So when 2022 rolls around and the market crashes because of inflation, all these companies' stock plummet. Then magically, all of these fun little lawsuits start popping up all over the place against realtors who kept surviving while these co big companies tanked. And through all this, they were able to establish a narrative that says that you are overpaid as a realtor with newspapers, media outlets, and cable news running stories about this constantly. Oh, by the way, all owned by BlackRock. You see, big companies have a real issue competing against local agents and lenders because people ultimately want to work with someone that they know and trust in one of the largest transactions that they're ever going to make in their life. It's the biggest reason why they've been trying for 20 years to penetrate this market but haven't been able to do it. But now it looks like they may have found the magic bullet. All these lawsuits showing up, suing for anti-competitive practices, and now the Department of Justice gets to magically reopen an antitrust case that's been closed for a couple of years. Because even after the settlement, again, the Department of Justice didn't feel like it was far enough. And so if all this plays out the way it's looking that it's going to, and you have all these corporate-owned entities controlling a big share of the market. Now, remember, realtors are not going away. I don't want you to think me telling you all this means that we're just all of a sudden in a six months, there's not going to be any realtors. There absolutely will be. There'll be plenty of realtors out there that are professional, that are doing a great job, that are representing sellers and representing buyers in certain circumstances that are going to continue to make a very nice living doing their job. But if you fast forward 10 years, I don't believe that's going to be 
the bigger share of the market or hell it might be split 50 50 because when these corporate owned entities come into play and some of these small guys are gone or just diminished then everything gets more expensive and at that point there's nothing as a consumer that you can do about it like i stated earlier right now it's cheaper to rent it really is and any if you're ever going to tell your clients that it's not it's not the truth currently right now because there are more rental units available than there are homes to purchase it is cheaper to rent but it comes with renting you have no equity, you're renting forever, you're living paycheck to paycheck, moving from place to place. And as the housing supply dries up and they stop building rental units, which they have already, and people, more and more poop people move into renting, then you're going to start to see rents go up because at that point, there'll be a captive controlled market. But it's like the frog boiling in the water. You have no idea that it's occurring because you're just living your life day to day to day. And then you look back three years and you were paying $1,500 in rent and now you're paying $2,500 and you're like, what the hell happened? And you have no other choice because now home prices have gone so high that you couldn't afford it even if you tried. And with home builders not building enough homes to keep up with demand, I don't see where this problem gets alleviated. And oh, by the way, the biggest investors of these builders are also the same guys, BlackRock, Vanguard. So now the question is, how do we fight this and what do you do? Well, think of your business like the ice wall in Game of Thrones. On one side of the wall, we bicker and fight with each other for business and space to try to see who's going to be the dominant person in that particular market. But on the other side of this wall are these things that have been trying to get to you for years. And they're more dangerous than anything that could possibly be on the wall that we're on the on the side of the wall that we're on. But here's the thing about that wall. That wall is represented by your connection to your community, your friends, your family your relationships. That's the thing that BlackRock does not own and cannot ever own. And this is your advantage. You're this little David against a big Goliath coming to try to take your business, but you have weapons. You just have to use them. And like I've said multiple times through this episode, there's always going to be a place for realtors in the market, at least for the foreseeable future. Just like there are CPAs that still earn a really good living despite the fact that TurboTax exists. Just like there are still really good travel agents out there that people are willing to pay, even though you can go on to Expedia and book your travel. And just like there are still reputable lawyers, even though in this case, I'm not a real big fan of those guys, that get paid very well and make a great living despite the fact that the law dogs and Texas Hammer and LegalZoom exist. You see, the secret to winning in this shifting market is to continue to harbor and create strong relationships and become a master at your craft. And then learning how to tell the world about what you do and why it is so incredibly valuable. But this is not easy. And many people out there, heck, most people out there won't be able to do this and will be lost to all of this change. But there are gonna be plenty that survive and plenty that absolutely thrive. It's just gonna be up to you which one of those you are. Look guys, my feeling right now is that we might have about six more months of what I would call business as usual. And I think I'm even being generous with that. So that means that right now is the time to start changing how you do your business and become a true real estate professional. It's gonna be the only way that you make it to the other side of all this change. We cannot stop the change. We can only learn how to adapt and how to survive inside of it. And just like Darwin's survival of the fittest, if you can adapt to the new environment, you will have success and you will make a career out of it and you will continue to earn a great living. But Sticking your head in the sand and not acknowledging that all of these threats are entering the market is naive. You have to be willing to recognize the train that's coming down the path and adjust your business to make sure that you can survive past. And all it takes is work. Well, guys, that's all for today. Again, I'm really not trying to be doom and gloom, but this is all just the reality of the situation. And you gotta know what's happening so you can make the changes accordingly because you still wanna keep providing for your family in a career that you've built your entire life around. It is not ending, it is just changing. And change, as always, breeds opportunity. Hope you guys can tune in this Thursday when I talk to Mr. John Liss. John is the CEO of True Footage, and he has a fresh take on how appraisals may be handled going forward. But he also wrote his entire thesis in college about real estate commissions and NAR and how they interact, and has a very unique take on how all this stuff plays out. And he's going to tell us all about it on Thursday. But until then, be good humans and keep grinding, because life is what you make it. So make it great.